Okay, so for this video today, we are going to have a discussion about asymptotic bounding and, and bounding the asymptotic nature of our functions. So I always say things like O of N or N squared, but what do I really mean? I, I kind of addressed this in another video where I talked about what uh, asymptotic functions actually mean and what these boundings mean, but I think it's time to go very deep into this topic and get very detailed and mathematically rigorous about what I'm actually saying. So before I continue on, if you have not subscribed to the channel, subscribe to the channel and like this video. My goal is to make this one of the world's largest software engineering resources for preparing for interviews. And this is a very large component of that, understanding how to bound asymptotically. So first, let's look at our most common bound, which is the upper bound, which is the big O bound. And we're going to look at the mathematical understanding behind it, and I will make it as simple as possible so that we can really understand what we're actually saying when I say big O of N. So, okay, the way that asymptotic bounds work and the way you really should think about this is every time you have a piece of code or you have an algorithm, it requires resources. These resources come in the form of taking up time, or taking up space. And our job is to analyze how much time and space does this algorithm take? Because that is of interest to us. The more we can understand how an algorithm behaves, the better we can optimize it, see where its flaws are, see where we can improve things, and we can improve its asymptotic uh, nature. So first of all, I keep saying the word asymptotic. What does that mean? So asymptotic, as you probably are familiar with the concept of asymptotes, is the nature of a graph or a nature of a function as it reaches a, a untouchable bound, as it reaches a very large value, it, it approaches a certain value, right? So it's about the nature for ends that are arbitrarily large, ends that are very, very, very large beyond what you could even imagine. Because when we see how a function behaves on the tail end, on the asymptotic end, that is when we have a true understanding of its performance. Because some algorithms might run faster initially, we might have a curve running like that, and then we might have a line running like that. Initially the curve is faster or slower, but on the tail end is when we see who really wins. So enough talking about this, let's see an actual definition. So first what we need to see is we need to understand the work we're doing. So let's define a function. It's normally called T of N for the work that our function does. Okay, so we have T of N right there. So this is the either the time or the space a function takes as N changes. Do you see how N is the parameter to the function? As we modulate n, I can move n up or I can move n down. When I do that, the output, the output of that function changes. And our job is to bound the change in that function, bound the possibility of how this function can change as n gets very large. So you'll see what I mean. We have our function of how things change versus how we modulate n. So now what we need to do is establish the definition for big O. And we'll get into the other bounds, but let's just look at big O, which is the upper bound. Okay, so let's look at the rigorous mathematical definition for big O, which is an upper bound. It's upper bounding work. So let's read this verbatim and see what it means, see if it makes any sense. T of n is bounded, upper bounded, by f of n if and only if t of n is less than or equal to some constant c times f of n, the function we chose to bound with, for all n greater than the initial n or n naught. So this, this, does this make sense? To me, it really doesn't make sense. This is the definition that we get in our introductory classes. This is the definition we get when we first learn it. And this is, this is too thick for me to understand. So why don't we break it down and really see what this is suggesting to us? So first, what this is actually saying to us, what it's proposing is we have a certain amount of work. We're doing a certain amount of work given by the function t of n. That's our actual graph. That's the actual work the algorithm does. We want to bound it. We want to put a bound over it, a cover over it, and we'll see what that looks like using a function called f of n. So we say t of n can be upper bounded, big O, upper bounded by f of n. And what are the conditions? How do we know that f of n satisfies? How do we know that f of n can upper bound us? Okay, are you still with me? So 
We only can declare this is true if and only if this is true. The function that we have, if we multiply our bounding function, f of n, by some constant, we will be able to always, always, always keep t of n under our bounding function. So let me show you, this is an example, and this doesn't need to make sense right now, but it will make sense once I do this example. So our job is to choose a c so that f of n bounds t of n, our actual work. So let's, let's do a bounding right now so you see exactly what I mean. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna explore bounding. We're gonna do and try to satisfy what that guy just told us. So here's t of n, here's our function. And what I want to do is I want to choose a class of functions. We know our class of functions of how we can bound. Well, we'll become familiar with them over time, but we want to bound this somehow. So why don't I start with trying to bound this? So let me define a function that might bound this. Maybe it might bound it, maybe it might not. Let's try it right now. Okay, so here is our function t of n, and I made a random choice. I said, I wanna to try to bound with n squared. So our function we want to try to bound our work with is n squared. So we see n squared. This is the raw function of n squared multiplied by c being one. Okay, so what we're doing is c times our function is going to be the result of the function we're trying to bound with. Stay with me, this'll make sense in a little. And now here is the critical, critical point. Am I able to modulate this base function of n squared so that for all values of a constant I need to find, this t of n stays under it. So why don't we go crazy? Why don't we turn c and turn c to 100? And now let me change our graph. Okay, and now is this true? If I take all n values on this axis and I go from n naught, which might be zero, all the way to the end, far, far, far away, will t of n always stay below this function? And what you see here is, it looks like it will. This guy's diverging off to here, he's going to stay linear, and what we see is, this is a correct bounding. This is an upper bound. We have satisfied the rules that Big O imposed on us because we found our constant. We found a constant C that keeps T of N below the bounding function. What is the bounding function? The bounding function is N squared. So what can I declare right now? So what I can now declare is that this function is upper bounded by N squared as long as I can choose some multiple c, I just proved I can choose a, a multiple c that will keep this function t of n below me at all times. But do, do you see a problem with this? Do you see a problem of choosing n squared? I mean, this looks like a linear graph. We're familiar with linear time. Don't you think we could improve on our upper bounding? So this brings me to my next concept of how tight is our bound? How tight is our bound? So this is something that is always to be considered. When we're trying to bound something, we want to be as accurate as possible to not have all this extra wasted space above the function. When we're bounding, we wanna be as tight and exact as possible to what the function's going to do on the tail end. So while big O of n squared is an upper bound for this function, it is not a tight upper bound, it is a loose upper bound. And what we need to do is we need to find a tighter uh, f of n to bound this. So let's try a different f of n. So what we're going to try is a different function. We know our functions again, and we're gonna try something faster, something to the order of uh, O of n. And what we're going to try is we're gonna try f of n as the n value. And this is what the graph would start out like. We'll start c out at one. So right now we are searching. We are searching for a c value that allows us to keep t of n underneath this function at all times for all n values, for all n values. So what we need to see is c is one. Have we achieved or satisfied our constraints? We have not satisfied it. We see that t of n is still beating this f of n, and we have not chosen a correct constant. So why don't we go crazy again? Why don't we choose some crazy constant like a thousand? Okay, that's better. We chose a very, very large constant, and we see that n does satisfy 
as a good f of n to bound our function. Obviously, this isn't mathematically rigorous. So I'm just trying to get the idea across. But do you see how all it is about is the function in a big O notation, the function in those brackets is a base function. That is a base function we choose, and after we choose the base function, we have to prove. We, it is an absolute must that we need to be able to find a C that keeps the actual work below C times the base function. So it should start coming together now, but we chose a crazy C value. Let's cho choose a more reasonable one. Okay, so it looks like we're getting tighter and tighter to the bound. And I mean, we could go and asymptotically get closer and closer to T of n. We could keep choosing smaller and smaller c's until we touch T of n. But the, the point is proven. We've proven that f of n succeeds as a bound. So what we can say is this is a bound to the order of linear time. So whenever I say linear time, I'm, I'm not talking about a specific function, I'm talking about a, a behavior, I'm talking about a behavior of being able to choose a way to bound these functions where c can be modulated. We can change c, but the base function is our behavior, it defines our behavior. So we can say this. Okay, so we see that this is to the order of linear time. We're getting tighter and tighter with our upper bound, and I hope the definition starts to make sense. We choose our base function, we find a C value and prove that T of N stays under it and our bound works. That is a valid upper bound, whether it is loose or tight. We prefer tight bounds though, but it's still an upper bound and it satisfies the definition for big O. Big O is an upper bound. So what we need to also see is when do I fail? So why don't I get very aggressive? Again, we know our classes of boundings, you'll get familiar, familiar with them again, but why don't we be even more vigorous in how we try to bound? Why don't we bound to logarithmic time and do log n time? So let's try that. Let's choose log n as f of n. Okay, so our, our choice here is to use log n as our function, f of n. That is the function I'm going to try to choose a c value for, to keep t of n underneath me because I am bounding over t of n. I want t of n underneath me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to choose a c value. So let's draw the logarithmic function. Okay, so that right there is our function f of n times a constant c, we'll say it's one. And we see that it does not satisfy our requirements. So what we need to do is we need to bump our C value up. So let's try to bump C and try to stretch our graph upwards. Let's try to see if that bounds T of N. So why don't we choose a value like 10? Okay, so we chose another value for C. We chose the value of C is 10. So what we see is 10 times log N are we bounding our T of N? Now my drawing skills aren't the best, but you can see that T of N eventually beats the function that we're trying to bound by. Our bound is snapped, it is broken, and we see that our C value is bad. So why don't we choose an even crazier C value and see what happens? Why don't we add another zero, call it 100, make C 100. Okay, so you see that there's a race going on here. T of N is doing its own thing, and our function c times f of n is doing its own thing. Our base function has a behavior. And I mean, these graphs have a shape in themselves and that defines their tail behavior. And it's kind of obvious to see that we will never, ever, ever pick a c value. We can never find a c value that is going to bound t of n. So watch how, what happens when I extend these graphs. So that's probably off camera a bit, but you see that the t of n is not bounded by this function, although we picked a very large constant, and we could keep picking values. We could pick, we could pick a thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand. If I go to n as a very large value, eventually, eventually, it is not going to bound t of n. Eventually, this function will be beaten by t of n, t of n will be slower than it, and we cannot declare this as an upper bound. We realize that we have failed, and log n cannot bound this linear function. So the reason you can't bound something that runs in linear time to uh, log n time, you can't upper bound linear time with log n time, is because eventually, the linear time function is going to be slower than the log n time function. We see initially it's faster, but at some point 
we lose this function loses. It can't be an upper bound. So log n fails as an upper bound. And we see that the best bound we achieved is O of n. So a lot of times people ask, why do we drop constants? Why do we drop constants? Well, the reason we drop constants is because the very definition of an asymptotic bound is all about modulating constants to achieve a behavior. It's all about a behavior because the, the constants are, are internal to the very definition of choosing a bound. So it would not make sense for me to say big O of 2n. Big O of 2n is not really saying much because we are just saying we're trying to bound some multiple against f of n, which would be 2n. But there's no point because we could choose any c value. So it does not make sense to have constants because it's about behavior. So that, that is the critical thing about this. That's the main idea I want to get across. The whole idea of the behaviors choosing constants and having a tight or having loose bounds um, with our functions. So this was a peek at asymptotic bounding with big O, the upper bound. So let's look at our other two bounds and then discuss some other bounds shortly. So if you understood the previous concept, this concept should be simple. Big O was about upper bounding functions and think about it. In the worst case, we care about an upper bound. What is the worst I'm going to do? Well, I can upper bound that. So for the best case, I care about lower bounds. For the best case, I care about lower bounds. We lower bound with big omega. So big omega cares about the, the lowest amount of work. The lowest amount of work, we undercut t of n, and we want the lowest amount of work that a function will, will do. We wanna bound that asymptotically. So why do we care about this for the best case? Well, the thing is, if we have a best case, I want to know what is the fastest this can run. If I'm looking at a best case, I care about the lower bound. Well, we can upper bound it, but we, it's more interesting to know the fastest it can go, which is the least work it can do, which is the lower bound, which is big omega. So what we can do here is we can choose an f of n. Let's try an f of n like this. Okay, so we immediately see that this works because this function, that we're bounding with stays below t of n at all times. And we declare this as arbit an arbitrary function, just n squared, the t of n is n squared here. And what we see is that this linear function undercuts all the values, it lower bounds the work. The least work this function do does is going to be linear. And is this tight? It's, it's not as tight as it can be because we can go even tighter like so. So what we can do is we can actually bound on the bottom even tighter to n log n here. So our function is n squared and the next lower order type of function we could use is n log n. And again, there's a great resource online called bigocheatsheet.com which goes through the different orders of, of boundings we can use. They look like this. I'll leave that there, they look like that. Um, but this is a little lower than n squared and it's going to give us a tighter lower bounding and that's what big omega is about, a tight lower bound. So now that we understand uh, big O and we understand uh, big omega as our lower bound, we can look at theta, which is just theta because we can't have a bigger little, we'll see why, but just theta and we're going to look at how that bounds things. Okay, so when we're talking about theta and bounding to theta, we're talking about a tight bound or an exact bound. So this is a combination. We're taking our upper bound, our lower bound, and smooshing them together, and that breeds theta. That breeds what this is. So if I have this function t of n, I need to find a f of n that bounds this from the top and bounds this from a bottom from the bottom asymptotically. So when we combine these two asymptotic bounds, it is an exact bound on how this function behaves in, in, the tail, in, in its tail behavior. So what we can do is, why don't we try a bad function that won't work? Let's try n squared. Okay, so we see n squared. Is n squared an upper bound for this? Well, yeah, n squared is an upper bound for this, but is n squared a lower bound? We see n squared is not a lower bound for this because it's above the t of n. We've automatically lost. We automatically lose. This is not bounding from the bottom. It bounds from the top, but it doesn't bound from the bottom. 
So why don't we try something different? Why don't we try something to the order of linear time? This looks linear to me. So I need to show that my f of n can upper bound this and lower bound this. So why don't we choose c for 100 to see if we can upper bound? Okay, so we chose a c of 100 to multiply by f of n, and we see we've achieved an upper bound. So why don't we multiply uh, f of n for a lower bound? Why don't we change it so that we can lower bound t of n? Okay, so this might not be accurate to scale, but what we see is that we were able to choose a C for the upper bound. We satisfied big O's constraint. We were able to choose a C for a lower bound. We satisfied the constraint for having a big omega lower bound. And now what we did is we proved that f of n is a fit function. It is fit to serve as an exact bound for this function because of our ability to choose the correct C values. So what I can say about that function is that we can tightly bound to the linear order of time, to the order of linear time where n is our f of n. We were able to choose constant C so that we could upper bound big O, lower bound big omega, and therefore the n, f of n equaling n is a function that is able to exactly bound t of n. So those are the boundings that you need to understand. You probably won't use theta, you probably won't use big omega, but I just want you to be familiar with them because I mentioned them and I mentioned them in passing situations and I've never taken the time to actually explain myself and, and be clear about what is actually meant with each of these bounds. So onto something else, why do we say big O? Why do we say big omega? And there's no big theta technically because there is no little theta. So I'm going to link an article that's a really good article in the description about why we have big O and why we have little o, why we have big omega and why we have little omega. But those are things that you're going to very, very rarely use, but I mean, it's just cool to know them. So I'm gonna link that below and you can look at that. If you understood what was talked about here, you're going to certainly understand those. So that is all for this video. I hope this made sense. I really wanted to go in depth on explaining asymptotic bounds because it's it's very important not to just skim over them. It's good to know the mathematical definition, and then after we know the definition, we can just be loose and say, this is linear time, or this is uh, quadratic time, and know that in the back of our minds, we actually know what we actually mean. That's all for this video. If you like this video, hit the like button and subscribe to this channel. Again, my goal is to build one of the world's largest or most helpful resources for software engineering interviews. We have uh, hundreds of topics left and about probably one or two years in this project before I think it's complete to my taste. And yeah, that's, that's basically it.